Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be, from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Hello, I'm Rosemary Brandenburg, SDSA. I'm so pleased to welcome set decorator Rebecca Alloway, SDSA from London to discuss her set decor on Andor, which is now streaming on Disney+. Rebecca, thank you for joining me. Really excited about the interview with you, especially as I know you've been here too. Tell me a little bit about how you happened to come to the project. To be really truthful, I have a son who's now 16 and he's always saying, when are you going to do a show or a film that actually I'd really enjoy watching? And he's a big Star Wars fan and I've surrounded by men in my family and women in my family who are big Star Wars fans. I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this one for the family. And so that's why I said yes. It has to be said that I think it's one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever done. I never realized how quite how creative it would be. It ticks all the boxes of the Imperials and the spaceships and everything that the, you know, Star Wars fans love to see. But what I also love about this project is we're going into you know people's houses and real worlds and and that was a real challenge i mean i had to do a very very deep dive into everything star wars and understand the world and the boundaries in fact it was just like maybe doing a period movie where you have a kind of small history of ta you know time you have this is the history and you absorb when gas lighting came in or this came in or you absorb the history and then when you know the boundaries, then you can push it. So that's what I did. I was like, right, this is just, this is the Star Wars history book. It doesn't matter whether it's fantasy. I have to take it very seriously. And that's where I started. And then un once I understood it, then started having fun. I mood board everything to an inch of my life. From my mood boards, I then concept everything. But we're talking hundreds and hundreds of technical drawings, drawing up furniture. So the challenge for me was that I'd only come from film. Rather than having 60 sets, we had hundreds of sets. But we didn't want that to get in our way of still producing quality and depth. Um, so it, it's been a huge, huge, huge challenge. The project you did and the one I did, The Rise of Skywalker, are extremely grounded. They were built not using, for example, the volume, which was done for Mandalorian. So were you, I mean, it's just, a, it's almost a different animal, isn't it? Oh, it's completely different. And I think that's also, I mean, it's a kind of, in a way, a sort of dream job for a, an actor and a set decorator. I don't think many people realize quite how much we've built and how little visual effects there are. I mean, of course, there's spaceships, uh, Ferrex, our town, it entire, pretty, I think there was the odd green screen at the end of a, an alleyway, but that was very, very, very few. It was a completely composite set where people's workshops, people's houses, everything flowed. You know, it, it was designed to lead the characters through. Um, I mean, you know, dream for director, set decorator, all the actors of like, you just make it so easy for us because it feels like such a real world. And when we open a cupboard, no one's thrown in hidden wires or, you know, everything is thought through. It's a real gritty world and everything was built. Every little detail of set decoration, I tried to think through like I would on a film set. But it's been an enormous challenge because as the amount of sets we've produced and Tony writes like a thriller. So it's kind of from, you know, jumping from one place to another place as if we're on location. And obviously every single piece of furniture almost has been designed and built. I mean, a lot has been adapted, but um, the shows that I've done, a lot was designed from scratch and it's a huge amount of work. I mean, a lot of fun, amazing prop making team. 
when you say start a, a film as a set decorator you might have the odd concept artist helping you to uh, design and create the furniture you give them a style a feel a material an idea and they then concept the furniture on a show like this at the art department have had two concept artists for example I've had four. There's been so, so I've got more concept artists than the art department, which is ridiculous. So every single piece of furniture is kind of, you know, the idea of everything has been, yeah, has been concepted, has been designed, has been 3D modeled and rendered as a proper piece of furniture, then is broken out into a drawing and then goes through the process of, of being made. And I, I, I think on season one, we were at something like 250 concepts just for set deck. And, you know, there's many different worlds that you did for season one, uh, starting with a Ferrix, which was just marvelous. The brick, the texture, the interiors, exteriors, it felt like they just flowed, that the interiors were actually there at the exterior. Is that right? Yeah. So the, so Luke designed it as a composite set. Every set it wasn't a visual effect, it was built. You went from the main high street, up steps, through alleyways, into workshops, into someone's home. So it was a massive, massive build. So much of the exteriors are, and some of the interiors are derived from the idea that these guys break down spaceships. The actual concept of it with Ferrix is that it's a kind of a world outside of the empire, but it's very helpful because they strip, basically they strip spaceships and resell them. So the whole of Ferrix is like a salvage town. That's how everyone makes makes their money. But like any town based on a craft, you know, then you've got your coffee shop, your noodle bar, all your supporting, you know, shops. Can I just say, this set was also dressed and, you know, concepted and dressed at the same time as also, this is what I couldn't quite get my head around, a tandem unit. So we had another block filming as well. We had other things going on as well. So this was this was one set, even though within it there were 60 odd sets. One of those 60, of course, is Marva's place. And one of the things I really appreciated was the amount of little backstory that you guys put in there with plants and hydroponics and her kitchen and there was bottles I, I it was never quite explained what she does but it's it, she's obviously very busy I'm sure you had lots of ideas about what she did I mean the backstory for Marva is that she has now got to a point where she's obviously quite old and really refined to her to, to her chair but Back in the day, she was the main kind of salvage dealer of Ferrix. This is part of her, her life that was. Her backstory is here in her room. And some things she's kind of just can't let go of. Some things obviously have disappeared, you know, her hydroponics. And, and obviously it gets, it gets quite cold. It's by the mountains in Ferrix. So we padded in true Star Wars style um, insulation and, and made kind of uh, padded, if you can see in the back there, rolls of, of uh, insulation, but then made that as part of the design, but a practical because in the winter they'd come down. When there are things that are very dear to her that she hasn't wanted to get rid of, and also her hydroponics. It was something that she had always done. She potted and did her plant. So it kind of, you know, giving her something to do within the space. It's texture. It's interesting. A little bit Star Wars. And her nurturing as well. I think the, the plants are, you know, she she adopted, adopted Cassian. She saved Cassian. And her, you know, the plants are also about how nurturing her character was. So everything, every little thing in that, her space has a little backstory to Marva. There's lots of great environments in here. We've talked a little bit about the mechanical origins of the town or the reason for being. And there's Bix, the character Bix, who is, I guess, Cass's old girlfriend, and she's a mechanic. And then there's a wonderful industrial set where Cass meets Luthen Rail. Yeah, that was um, our factory set, exactly. And that was one of the first things we shot. Oh, that was a massive amount of work as well. 
it looks like it's a massive sort of visual effects and special effects set, but actually, of course, everyone did their thing, but we manufactured the engines. Most of that, again, is what's so amazing about this show, it was done in camera. So of course, the kind of the lasers were visual effects and the special effects did an amazing job with explosions, but actually all those engines were made by us in set deck and we had to make rubbers and um, and ones that were just set and then they were all on hoist and they're all on the rig and that was that was a lot of work so that was they swang in action so yeah uh, that looks like a big old uh, visual effect but that was done I'd say 80% of that was done in camera changing styles dramatically we move over to Coruscant which I assume is a completely different planet and this is the Imperial headquarters, as well as the fantastic sets that you did with more personal detail. And then, of course, here we have, for example, the wonderful antique shop. You had a front room with the exhibits and displays of all of the antiques. And then you had the back room, which was the workshop. There's really a lot of fabulous things in here. Um, I just, I don't know where to start. There's just the antiques. How'd you come up with these ideas they're so different than anything we'd ever seen well this was one of my lockdown projects luthan's uh, um antique shop which is a which obviously is a front was the something that i mood boarded in in lockdown where do i begin the fundamentals were ancient japan and would take artifacts from ancient japan and then concepted them and, and gave them a twist some of the artifacts, which the fans all know, there were quite a lot of Easter eggs in there as well. There's a, a few key Star Wars Easter eggs. So I uh, had great fun also flicking through all the past Star Wars artifacts and books and picked out and asked Star Wars, you know, at Disney's permission to then recreate some Star Wars headdresses that had um, being on actress, you know, the actress many years ago and various Easter eggs. This had to be curated like an art gallery. If you go to an art gallery, the same person buys the art, you know, or if you go to a beautiful antique shop, the same person. So I kind of had to tap into what I thought would be Luthen's taste. And then everything's very different, but it had to have a connection. And it was really me trawling and researching and instinctive too once I tapped into where I was going with it and that really feels like something that Luthen would would sell then then obviously I had to change it and give it a, a a twist but that's how I began this the I think I must have done about 10 mood boards for all the artifacts and then concepted them and then in the back room of course is where all the the secret dealings go on and it just looks fantastic with just a cacophony of lenses and microscopes and working and little saws and things like that that was wonderful yeah that was his big workshop and we just had fun there's secret drawers and you know it's not just about the front of his work you know of, of having a workshop it's also a front for the rebellion so everything isn't quite what it seems I mood boarded you know various sort of workshops metal works the art of fixing pottery, Japanese, and and I suppose my starting point is always looking at what this would be in the real world, and then each area was divided into an actual real workshop, and then shelving rather than having shelving. Actually, Karina, my brilliant production buyer, who I know you've worked with, the shelving's uh, air hostess units from a stripped aeroplane, so it had a sort of quality and a rawness about it. And then every drawer has, you know, a, a liquid or a soldering iron. It was all about his love of antiques. So if anyone, if anyone came into the back room, it definitely gave his character weight and no one would ever know that he was kind of fronting the rebellion. To contrast, another, another environment in Coruscant, of course, is Cyril's mother's apartment. When Cyril is roundly dismissed, it is quite something. Can you tell us how this one came about? Yeah, again, this was another lockdown project. Most of the worlds I'd mood boarded. So actually, it was a balance between the sort of very, very sparse um, Coruscant 
um, you know, the different elements and also the different levels of Coruscant, depending on where you live. This was like middle Coruscant where she lived and slightly dated. As you can see, it has a kind of like Macquarie 1960s, sort of 1960s feel. So we went sort of back slightly further. So she kind of ticked the box of what she wanted in her apartment before she moved in. She's got her hair unit and her kitchen. So what's brilliant is Luke trusts me to kind of go off and concept. So by the time the, the art department concept was done, I'd already concepted the kitchen. So the art department concept artist dropped all the kitchen units that I did in lockdown. So I took inspiration from um, Ralph McQuarrie and the unit you saw, the, the round cooking unit was something found in one of his original drawings and it is actually a cooker and then I slightly changed it and made it sort of suitable for Edie's apartment. Uh, the rest of the kitchen was a little take on that and I referenced show homes in the 1960s where kind of griddle pans flipped up and you know I doubt any of the kitchens were ever made but they're really fantastic reference from um, 1960s show homes and it just felt like it one tick the box of what the period we wanted it to be. It felt to me that it was very much about her character as well. Then moving on to another amazing environment in Coruscant, which is of course the glorious Mon Mothma's Chandrillian Embassy. Just the color control and the blooming bonsai trees and the flowers and the chandeliers and the sconces and the table and the chairs. I mean, and the wonderful sunken sofa. I mean. Where do you start? Pretty much everything on the mood board that I found and referenced and thought that's rather wonderful and that works with the character we then made and, and put into the set. It sort of came together with the architecture that Luke was designing too. So we both kind of work along the side of each other and then come together and it all sort of just flowed. I mean, the idea really was that tapping into uh, her, the old ancient Chandrillian culture and the closest culture I could think of was Japan. So a lot of my reference was Japanese. It's not her home. I mean, it's where they're living, but it's where they, they you know, it's the embassy. It's the Chandrillian embassy. So it's where they've made home. So I concepted, obviously, all the table and chairs and the lights. The chandeliers were amazing. So my team found a company that made the chandeliers for various architect and design companies I think one did the shard the shant the lights in the shard the sofa came from again a mood board with just referencing a 70s pit and then it became a bigger thing and then it became a kind of key focal point for their conversation and then from that it sort of developed the furniture I referenced various architects along the way it needed to feel sophisticated and detailed I suppose also my fear was that if it didn't have enough weight it would feel as if we'd made it it would feel rather prop like so you know everything I considered and visualized how I thought it might look at the end so it didn't feel like it was a kind of prop made table and obviously because of the space Luca designed this big space everything had to be made so the size of the table obviously and the design of the table. And I knew that we'd be shooting all the way through the space. It very much flowed. So I knew that the, the bases of the table would be just as important as the table itself and all part of the architecture. So Luke and I very much referenced the same architects with the step work. And, and I then drew that all those references into the furniture and he drew the references into the architecture and it all sort of came together. Everything in that set, except for the chairs, which my fantastic buying team found and we painted and upholstered, everything in the set was made. So the lights, the wall lights, the table, the sideboards, but it meant that every bit of furniture could be built and made to fit that space. It wasn't about lots of furniture. It was about the weight of the furniture and had a presence. The tree coming through was an amazing reference that I found. And I know that we were considering doing 
sort of courtyard and then that went out that uh, that went by the wayside so I still wanted to hang on to bringing some of the outside in and also Luke loved that idea because he imagined that maybe the embassy was in high Coruscant and possibly then you know this was sort of the highest you could get and in almost you know the sort of on the roof and the greens team did a fantastic job of you know most of the bon the bonsais and the, the tree blossom breaking through obviously were all molded from bits of driftwood and again I concepted them gave them the shape of where we wanted to go with everything and then they put it together can you describe a little bit the staff that you use and the different departments that you have at your beck and call of course in the U.S or at least in my part of the U.S., greens doesn't usually work for set deck, but in, in England, of course, they do. So, you know, greens, um, the building shops, the upholstery shops, the painting shops, the carpenters, uh, mold makers, all those people. Tell us a little bit about how, where you worked and how it all happened. We all discuss, you know, what the best way of, of producing something is. So we have, you know, it, we take an object and it might... It might start with the carpenters and then we get the prop makers involved and the, then it's then it goes to the paint workshop and then and then the upholstery. So, you know, the, the workshops are, um, have been massive. I have a massive team of carpenters, massive team of upholsterers, practical electricians, painters. I mean, not just one paint shop, but kind of, you know, three paint shops and not just one spray booth, but two spray booths. And it starts with really myself and the art directors, if it's a if it's a drawing from scratch, breaking it down. Karina and the buying team might be involved because there might be an element of a purchased piece that's added to the drawing. Then it goes from one workshop to the other. Everything's broken down, as you know, in into a into a drawing. So the drawing will be broken down you know with who's doing who's doing what and then every drawing is issued so everyone knows at which point you know that piece of furniture is is coming to their workshop and what they have to do I don't think everyone realized that actually each piece of furniture from the beginning mood board concept to being made is you know 10 to 12 weeks everything is scheduled through the makes team to an inch of its life so that's the only way um, and even more so on a show like this so every single thing if it's not on the chart no one knows about it so everything is kind of listed out so I have key set deck art directors that will oversee the makes and on a on a film often those art directors as you know might draw too but on a project like this purely they're just seeing the makes through and then you also have assistant set decorators, don't you? Absolutely. Divide the sets up depending on who's on my team and who likes to do what. I kind of decided that the easiest thing to do was for me, for me on season one, it's different on this one, was to take on all the really concept sets because there would be no point in someone translating it to the concept artist. It just needed to be me. So I took on Bertie's, I took on the prison, the embassy, Actually, a lot of the sets that you showed were, were my my sets and then all the other sets divided up. Sam, my brilliant senior assistant, loves doing ships. So she so we'd work on an idea. She'd go off, get pipes, ideas, fabrics, come back. We talk about colors. So, you know, that I'd have my own sets bubbling along and designing and concepting. And then I would give various assistants all the other sets to work on and of course you're also supervising props to some extent uh, perhaps mostly so the things that people carry and and even to some extent weapons and things like that is also under your purview to some extent well yes but not as in the prop master uh, very much the prop master in 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 our system will very much look after action props and weapons but as you say the, the designer and the set decorator have to lead the way. Like for the embassy, because the style of the glasses and the food and everything in there was so integral, we just said, look, do you know what, guys, prop to the prop team, we're going to do everything. And then we're going to say, this is the glass we want. And you've just got to buy 50 of them because that's what you're going to be using as action. So we actually just went, no, no, 
we've we've got this one guys all that's very integral i didn't want then someone else's interpretation of action props in it so depending on the set quite happy to let go of some of the weapons because that's not necessarily my remit and also I, you know, I had people on board doing the weapons that had done all the Star Wars, so I'd be silly to ignore that. But when it comes to some of the action props, we'd we'd do them and then, yeah, hand it over. Completely changing the subject to um, another wonderful setting was the prison factory and these tables that you made, these star-shaped tables, these manufacturing tables. I mean, they were pretty, pretty fantastic. And uh, there's a lot of action on them creating what I assumed was some sort of weapon system. I don't know if that's what the idea was. It's connected to the Death Star and they're working out their hours and Luke very cleverly designed a prison that worked in with, with, with nine different kind of units. The whole world was completely thought through by Luke and, and um, by Tony. And so this was one factory floor each table it was all about competition and making sure that they didn't die and it was all about speed it was like a ballet of tools we almost did like a, a an ikea flat pack designed for the tables when they were put together because so many different departments were involved with the mechanisms and how they were done this set was a huge joint effort i know that luke wanted to kind of make it feel more like a a, a lab kind of cross between a lab and an abattoir and he was kind of referencing kind of George Lucas's THX 1138 and it was you know so it was very different from everything else. There's so many other sets we don't barely have time to touch on and you spoke a little bit about the spaceships I mean your spaceships were great they were so cool you know you have to make up a new spaceship for Luthen and different people it was great. Yeah and each spaceship again was kind of full of character from the you know uh, Cassian spaceship you know that he collected junk in to Luthen spaceship it wasn't just like doing a spaceship that's been done it was then okay we're going to do a spaceship but then we're going to give it character so you know we had to then kind of all you know right how do we how do we bring character to this spaceship what's what's happening in it so that almost the spaceships in this in 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 um, Andor become like the homes, an extension of people's homes. They're not just like a car to get from A to B. So that was kind of fun. Rebecca, we've talked a little bit about how much the in-camera this project was versus a visual effects film or television show. Can you talk about how Luke Hull, the production designer, really emphasized the physicality of this project? Like no other project I've worked on, I would say that 95% of what you see where Luke's sets were built. Even down to the bridge in the prison, the backdrop falling away was obviously visual effects, but you know, we 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 built the exterior and interior of the prison, which actually probably no one no one realizes. Every single bit of ferrex, alleyways, stairways, inside people's houses, workshops, um, the bell tower. We built the bell tower. Now, you know, you might look at that and think that's a visual effect. So, I mean, he built everything and it quite an amazing gift for a set decorator because you've, you're in a real world and for the actors, quite incredible, really, quite incredible. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I hope we've covered this uh, enormous job. I mean, there were so many sets we haven't even touched on. They were just beautiful. I loved the series. It was really great. I can't wait to see season two. Um, and I want to thank you for coming out. And I want to thank um, our hosts, Disney Plus, who were kind enough to provide all the material and provide this interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great joy to talk about it again. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.